the Lord this evening, and um, hope you came ready to worship the Lord tonight. And um, we've got much to be in prayer for. Um, my prayer list is missing. I cleaned my Bible out, but we got much to be in prayer for. Remember, uh, Miss Cindy tonight. She went to the doctor today. And her incision's opening up a little bit, so they're a little concerned about that, but said it should be okay. So uh, keep her in prayer this evening. Remember Miss uh, Dot Webster in prayer as we go in prayer this evening. Um, also remember Gail Harris. I, I'm assuming Gail's still about the same. No news is good news. So um, remember her in prayer this evening and many others. Anybody else got anything on their heart tonight we need to pray about? It? Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Yes, remember her. Pray for Carrie too. She asked me to pray for her. Anything else? Not Brother Jim Gales, will you open us up in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to your house this evening to ask you to look in on all the ones on our prayer list. Whatever the situation may be, be it uh, health, financial, or just depressed spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask you to look in on them and help them, guide them, heal them. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, go with me to Revelation chapter number 1 tonight. Revelation chapter number 1. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 1. If I go too fast through something, tell me, okay? Because I have time to eat all of this and digest it, but sometimes teaching it's a different story. So if I'm too fast, I'll stop and ask. Am I going too fast? If I am, tell me what I missed, all right? Revelation chapter number 1 tonight. We're going to pick up in verse number 7. Uh, last week, uh, we dealt with the course of the age, with the blessing, uh, the substance of the blessing, the source of the blessing, and then we um, got on into from the blessings of God. Tonight, I want to deal with the second part of Revelation chapter number 1, and I don't know how far we'll get down through the slides tonight, but I've got us going through verse number 20. I don't think we'll get that far tonight, but uh, tonight, I want to deal first of all with the consummation of of the age. And when we think about the consummation of the age, when a writer writes a book, um, I don't like to read that good, so that's hard for me, okay? But when a writer writes a book and the writer begins to tell of action and excitement in that book, he usually waits and draws the ending toward the end to keep the suspense. When it comes to the book of Revelation, the Bible gives us the delivery and the doom in the middle and in the end of Revelation. And tonight I want us to pick up in verse number 7 tonight. And I want us to look, number one, if you're taking notes, at the eventual triumph of Jesus. The eventual triumph of Jesus. The Bible says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. I think that this is an important part. Every eye shall see him, and I'm going to get down in here in just a second. But when we think about every eye, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord, right? Jesus also said, I come to seek and to save those which were lost. But he also said in the beginning part of that verse, I'm not willing that any should perish. 
When he says any, that word any right there means how many? All, right? Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. And so when he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. When we get here, we know that there are two things about the eventual triumph of Christ. Number one, it is visible. Every eye shall see him. Every eye, when it takes place, will know. Exactly the triumph of Christ. When God summoned Israel out of Egypt, he marched, them, he marched before them all the way through the desert. And he gave them a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Every eye when they marched out of Egypt seen them. They seen the hand of God. The enemies in Egypt that was chasing the children of God when they came to the Red Sea, seeing God divide the Red Sea wide open, and seeing God deliver the people of God out of bondage, out of a, out of a place where they had been for so long. And every eye seen that in that day. And during that time, they, they seen a great deliverance. They've seen a great movement of God. And I believe tonight when the Lord comes back, Every eye shall see. Not every eye that sees will be going, but they will know what is taking place. When we think about that tonight, one of the most stirring pages in the English history tells of the conquest and crusades of Richard the Lionhearted. While Richard was away trouncing, his kingdom fell on bad times. His sly and graceless brother John usurped all the prerogatives of the king and misruled the realm. The people of England suffered, longing for the return of the king, praying that it might be soon. Tonight we know that our world is waxing worse and worse. Sin is on every corner. Sin is on every street. Sin is in every life. Sin affects the lives of us that are saved because we see what it does to our friends and our family who are not saved by the grace of God. Sin tonight is one of those things that is ruling the world. And I believe that we're praying, as the writer said, even so, come Lord Jesus quickly. Secondly, tonight, not only will it be visible, but the Bible says that it will be victorious. When we think about it being victorious tonight, all of the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. When we think about the second coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ delivered us from the payment of sin. He paid our sin debt. It delivered us from the penalty of sin. But his second coming tonight will deliver us from the presence of sin. Can you imagine today what this world would be like if there was no sin in the world? Could you imagine if you turned on the news and there was no murders, there was no rapes, there was none, no drunk drivers, if there was none of these evil things in the world, how much better our society will be? That is tonight why you and I as Christians should be prepared for the second coming of Christ because there will come a day. That he will deliver us from the presence of sin, from the power of sin. Think about this tonight when I think about the power of sin. The presence of sin is here, but the power of sin is also here. The power of sin tonight is those that are yielding their lives to sin. Those who are walking in the temptation of sin. Those who are unwilling to say, Lord, Help me to stay out of this sin. But instead they say, you know, I believe I'll do this sin. I believe that I will quit this sin and I'll begin this sin and then I'll begin this sin and I, it, it'll all work out. No, it won't. The devil paints a pretty billboard of what sin can do for you. But he doesn't tell you what sin will do for you. Sin tonight will wreck your home. Sin tonight will wreck your friendships. Sin tonight can ruin a church. Sin tonight can cut off, your, um, cut off your communication with God. The devil doesn't tell you all of that. 
When the devil went to Eve, as Mike taught on Sunday, when the devil went to Eve and told Eve, here, you can partake of this fruit. It's not going to hurt you. Well, didn't the Lord say, if you partook of this tree, that thou shalt surely what? Die. But what did she do? She yielded to her temptation. She said, you know what? I, what the Lord says about this just ain't right. I'm going to do it my way. Tonight, we must be careful that we not try to do things our way, but do things God's way. Secondly, tonight, are we good on the eventual triumph of Christ? If we are, say amen. amen. All right. Secondly, tonight, I want us to look at the everlasting triumph of Christ. When I think about that, go with me to verse number 8 tonight. Verse number 8, when you find your place there, say amen. The Bible says, I am what? Alpha and what? Omega. This everlasting triumph is based on the three attributes and the deity of Christ. First, he is omniscient. He says, I'm Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. The Lord Jesus is God's alphabet. The alphabet is an ingenious way of storing the accumulated wisdom of the race. The alphabet arranged in an endless variety of ways. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the first letter and the last letter. Think about this tonight. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, what? God created the heaven and the earth. We get over to the last book of Revelation tonight. Let's go back over there. I'll find my place right here in just a moment. I should have marked it in my Bible. I'm not good at that sometimes. Revelation chapter number 22. Revelation chapter number 22. He ends verse number 21. We know that this is not just a revelation of John, but this is a revelation of Jesus Christ in verse number 20. It says, He that which testified these things saith, Surely... I what? Come quickly. John replies back and says, Even so, come quickly. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We see he was the author of this world, the beginning of this world, and he is the ender of this world. Global warming will not end this world. Taxes will not in this world. Diseases will not in this world. But the second coming of Jesus Christ will end this world. Secondly, not only is he omniscient, but secondly, he is omnipresent. He says the what? Beginning and the what? Ending. When we think about this tonight, his omnipresence is stated here in terms of time. But it's just as true in the terms of space. The Lord is present in the midst of any company of his people, apart in any part of the world at any given moment of time. When we think about that tonight, you and I can call out upon God day or night, and during that time, God will what? Hear us. But what happens if I'm praying at 1 o'clock in the morning, and Brother Jim Gales is praying at 1 o'clock in the morning. And Brother Johnny Potts praying at 1 o'clock in the morning. God's hearing how many of us? All of us. Why is that? Did you say me? <laughs> he does. He does hear everybody. When I think about that tonight, there's not a prayer that he does not hear. It says, the Bible says, his ear is not so heavy that it cannot hear, neither is his hand shortened that he cannot save. And I'm grateful, and I will say this very truthfully, the midnight hours of our life, I'm grateful for those that are praying. I'm grateful for those, and I'm grateful to God who hears and answers every prayer. When we think about this tonight, it doesn't matter where we're at. We can pray and say, God, help me. There are times throughout the day, yesterday morning, I, and I'm not bragging on myself, but yesterday morning I got up, I got in the shower, and I was praying, and somebody and their family came to my mind when I was praying, somebody I haven't thought of in a couple weeks. 
I got out of the shower, I got on the road, and I messaged this person. I said, hey, I want to let you know for some reason this morning I said a prayer for you and for your family. And I hope you are doing well. If you need something, let me know. And they wrote me back and said, that's funny that you say that. We're sitting down here at Brenner's Children's Hospital. Our daughter's here having a biopsy, and they don't know what's wrong. And when I thought about that today, I said, when I thought about that yesterday, I got in my vehicle and I said, you know, there's been times that somebody's reached out to me and said, hey, I don't know the reason that I'm praying for you, but I prayed for you today. And I thought about if we could go into the eyes of God, when God looks down and he sees your struggle and he sees my struggle, but he goes over to somebody else and said, hey, I want you to pray for this person. He's there with the people that you're praying for, giving them the grace, comfort, and strength that they need. But he's also here listening to you pray for those people. I'm glad my God can be there all the time, ain't you? Thirdly tonight, he said, I'm the beginning, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. When I think, and, uh, which is to come, the Almighty. When I think about this, last, uh, lastly, in this per, part of the lesson tonight, I see him as the omnipotent. He says, I am the Lord which is, which was, and which is to come. The first part of this expression has already described the Father. It is now used to describe the Son. He is God in every sense of the word. He is the Almighty, an expression that occurs only ten times in the New Testament, and nine of them are in the book of Revelation. The first time the title occurs in the Bible is in 1 Samuel chapter number 1 and verse number 3. When Elkanah went up out of the city, of, went out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. He seen him and came back and said, But the Lord has not failed. He is Jehovah of hosts. Notice this. The Almighty. We, we used to sing a chorus, What a Mighty God We Serve. We used, we've sung the song, um, we sung the song Sunday, God is on the move. When we think about that tonight, when we get a hold of how big our God is, our God is an awesome God. He reigns, He serves. He's there for the just and for the unjust. He's there to give us grace. He's there to give us strength as we go through. Again, there is failure everywhere. The church has failed. And apart from the rapture remedy, it has become completely apostate. The church has failed tonight in recognizing that our Lord is the Almighty, the Almighty being the one that has died for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. He died for what? Our sins. Our churches have failed to preach on the crucifixion of Christ, the blood of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the second coming of Christ. In our day that we're in, we've got those that are preaching their opinion. They're preaching what they believe instead of what the Bible says. And it's time that when we read the Word of God, we study it. And I love this part, in context. And I've encouraged people recently to not just read your Bible, but study your Bible. The writer, the, Paul didn't say to young Timothy, Timothy, read your Bible to show thyself approved. Did he? He said what? Study to show thyself approved. Tonight when we think about studying the word of God, it's more than sitting down and reading Revelation 21a. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is... Blah, 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 blah. I'm done. I read my Bible today. Did you study? Did you understand what you was reading? Tonight when we think about that, you and I should study the word of God for ourselves. Even though that the church has failed, the world has failed, God has not failed. He has been with us through all the different church ages, and we'll get into that in a couple weeks. He, he has been with us through all of the church ages. He's with us till the ages to come. He said, I will never leave thee, nor what? Forsake thee. 
If God has made a promise to us in John's Gospel chapter number 14, he said that when I go away, I will what? Come again. That where I am, there ye may be what? Also. Then you and I should work until Jesus comes. Are we good with verse number 7 and 8? We all good? We good? Say amen. All right. Verse number 9 tonight. I want us not only the consummation of the age Verse number 9 tonight, and we probably won't get this finished, all right? Verse number 9 tonight, I want us to get to the character of the age. The character of an age. When we think about it, the character of an age, of the age, this is not talking about the actual age, like your actual age. It's talking about the time that we're in. We're told three things about the character of the age which we live. An age that we end with the rapture of the church. And it don't just end there. But for those that are left behind, it ends with the tribulation period. A few weeks ago in the introduction to the book of Revelation, I talked about the three types of beliefs that are inside of our church today. We have the pre-trib, the mid-trib, and the post-trib. I took a few moments that night and I explained to you why we should believe that we're pre-trib. Number one, the Bible talks about us. We were once the children of of wrath, but now we become the sons of God, right? What did God save us from? The wrath to what? Come. So if he saved us from the wrath to come, why would he allow us to go through the tribulation period, which is the wrath of God upon those who rejected him, right? Well, we can go mid-trib because the wrath of God is not being poured out until the last three and a half years. So the first three and a half years are good. Well, then we would have to tear out John's gospel chapter number 14 when Jesus said, and when I go away, I will send unto you a comforter. That comforter is who? The Holy Ghost. When God comes back and calls us out of this world, the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost will be withdrawn from this world world right so why would God leave a saved man in a place for three and a half years without the presence of the Holy Spirit in him that would be like me tonight walking outside of the doors of the church and standing there and y'all are sitting in here wondering what I'm doing out there my presence isn't here the Bible's not being taught nothing is happening so why should we believe tonight that the Lord would leave us in a place without the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's there to comfort us. The Holy Spirit's there to guide us. The Holy Spirit's there to convict us. The Holy Spirit is there to lead us from right from wrong. So tonight, you and I must realize that if we're going to be Bible believers, we can argue this, and I don't like to argue the Word of God, and I won't argue the Word of God, so you can be wrong if you want to be wrong. But tonight, when we study the Word of God, we must believe that we will be called out before the tribulation period. The first three and a half years will look fine and dandy to those that are without. The last three and a half years, and literally I say this, and I don't mean to mean mean when I say it, and I don't say this wrong, but it, it's going to be hell on earth. The Bible says that there are going to be men that cry out for the rocks to fall upon them, but the spirit of death has been removed. We was joking around the other day, Joe, the guy that comes here sometimes, he was on the job site the other day and he was telling us about um, he, he buys the, and I'm not making fun of him, I love him to death, he buys the um, preparation meals for if a hunger thing gets down. So I know where he lives, so if it ever happens, we'll go to his house, all right? We'll raid his garage. And we was talking about that, and he asked me, do I purchase them? And I said, no, I've never purchased them. Um, I'm nothing against purchasing them. Go for it. And uh, I said, I'll just go down to the church food pantry and lock myself up in there and make sure I don't go hungry. And we was joking about that, and uh, he said, "He said, but one of the crazy things was my buddy was telling me the other day that he had these so many thousands of rounds of ammo, of, um, ammo and all of these things. And he said, why are you going to be out in the middle of nowhere with all your ammo and all your food trying to survive when you're going to be in heaven with God? When you think about it in that way today, and I have nothing wrong with buying ammo. I have several thousand rounds myself. 
You say, what kind? That, ain't, none, that don't matter, but I got several thousand around myself. But when I think about that tonight, I, I think about it as a point of my faith is not in my ammo. My faith is not in my dollar. My faith is not in my food supply. My faith is in God. When we think about the age tonight, the character of the age, number one, it is an age of individual witness. The Bible says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. You go back and study Bible history, why was John on the Isle of Patmos? John had been dipped into a burning barrel of oil. And they said, John, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to dip you, and we're going to throw you on this aisle. And John, you're going to die. And God laughed. said, not today. I'm going to set you on this aisle. It's going to be me and you. And John, I'm going to tell you what I want you to write in the book of Revelation. What the world meant for evil to John, God meant for good. You know, there's been a lot of places in my life that people have meant for things to be evil. And they've said evil things to me. They've said evil things about me. Some are continuing. I don't know why. But anyway, they said evil things to me. They said evil things about me. They said evil things about all of the things around me. And they've meant to hurt me. They've, people said evil things about you to try to hurt you. But God said, no, I'm going to vindicate them. I'm going to help them. I'm going to stand behind them. When we think about John as an individual witness, John here is saying, I am the one that God is going to use. The church will not go through the great... And we've already dealt with this. And there's many verses here. The great time of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. If you want to study that out, and I'll give you this list of verses slowly, you can go to Jeremiah chapter number 30 and verse number 7. You got that? Say amen. All right. Matthew 24, 21. We got that one? Say amen. All right. Not many people said amen on that one. Y'all got that one? All right. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verses 1 through 9. Everybody got that one? All right. Good. So Jesus doesn't mean that we're exempt. Let me, let me rephrase this. We're not missing the tribulation period because we're exempt from persecution. Y'all with me on that? The tribulation is what? Judgment. Right? There's a difference between judgment and persecution. Judgment is if I'm a judge and you're a criminal. Let's use Daniel for an example. If I'm a judge and Daniel commits murder, and I say, you know what? Daniel, you murdered these people, and I'm going to sentence you to death. And if I was a judge and I sent somebody to death, they wouldn't have to wait 50 years to die. All right? It'd be immediate. All right? That's the way it should be. We shouldn't have to pay to feed all them, all them years in prison. All right? I would give them a gospel track and a Bible, and I'll say within the next eight hours, you better know where you're going. All right? But anyway, moving on. That's a controversial subject, I know. Moving on. So when we think about that tonight, Daniel has committed murder. I've sentenced him to death. What is that? judgment here's the difference persecution doesn't come from well it can does it come from a court but it comes from a group of people who hate the things of God God allows persecution to happen to prove who is real and who is fake. Remember the Columbine High School shooting and they asked the young girl, now that's a long time ago, wasn't it? They asked the young girl, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And on the recording she said yes, and she lost her life. 
That's persecution. The Bible tells us that we shall suffer persecution in the last days. It's around the corner. This world hates the church. This world hates Christianity. This world hates everything going on around us when it comes to the Word of God. There are those who mock the Word of God. There are those who make light of the Word of God. There are those that when you pull out your Bible, they call you a holy roller, a Bible thumper. They call you a fanatic. They call you a religious freak. They call you all of these things. They don't do that to help you. They do that to persecute you. If the Apostle Paul could go through persecution, then why are you and I exempt from persecution? We're not. Moving on tonight. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And you can find that in Acts chapter number 14 and verse number 22. The apostles were no strangers to persecution. John, at this point, was facing persecution. Everybody good on this part? If we're good, say amen. All right. Verse number 10 tonight. We're going to look at it's an age of extinctive worship. An age of extinctive worship. Have we gone too fast? Everybody caught up? All right. Verse number 10 tonight. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, I was in the what? On when? All right. How many of us, when we come to the house of God on Sunday, are in the spirit of God? How many of us on Sunday, don't raise your hand, but how many of us on Sunday, before we come to church, say, God, I want to be full of the Holy Spirit, and God, whatever happens in the church service today, I'm willing and ready for it. Lord, if you want to save a sinner, I'm going to rejoice. Lord, if somebody's going to rededicate their life that's been backslidden, I'm going to rejoice. Lord, if the preacher gets up there and preaches and calls out every one of my sins, I'm going to repent and then rejoice. John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great, what, voice. He said, as of trumpet. John was not only on the aisle, but John was in the Spirit. John in a human environment was on the aisle, but in a heavenly environment, was in the mind and the hand of God. You know, it would do us a lot of good if we, when we came to church, if we left, and I'm preaching to myself on this, okay? We left our problems at the back door and say, Lord, they're yours. When I come into the church tonight, I'm not going to worry about what's going on at home. I'm not going to worry what's going on on my phone. I'm not going to worry about what's going on. Throw in your coat on the floor. Not going to have to worry about what's going on here and there. But Lord, I'm going to come and I want your spirit to fill me, use me, and guide me in this time of worship. I'm not going to care what this side of the church does. I'm not going to care what this side of the church does. I'm not going to care what this side of the church does. Lord, I just want to be in your presence. We used to sing a song. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Before the Holy Spirit can fill this place, the Holy Spirit must fill you and I. You and I must have a a relationship and a communion with God and say, God, in order for you to fill the church house tonight and today, Lord, I need you to fill me. Lord, see if there be any wicked way in me. God, let me know, is there anything in my heart and in my life that is hindering you? from working in the church like you should. I would hate to know that I came to church with a bad attitude outside of the will of God and I was the reason that the Holy Spirit was grieved inside of the church house that kept a sinner from getting saved. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number 5 or chapter number 6 to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Tonight you and I must be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Quench not the Spirit. He was in two locations. He was on the aisle. 
in the spirit. He had a human environment and a heavenly environment. We must keep the two locations straight. A Christian once asked one time, if he were going to heaven, he said, I lived there. Was he right? No. Because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. A workman had a little store which he cobbled shoes. He also had an apartment upstairs over his shop. Someone asked him about this situation. He said, I work down there, but I live up here. John had learned the secret of life. I may be in the middle of an aisle by myself, but I'm in the presence of God. Tonight in our lives, it would do us good when we look at this world and say, I live in this world, but I'm in the presence of an almighty God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you have that mindset, when you go through a storm, when you go through a trial, I don't know why we're in all of that. We should be here in worship. We can look at the storm and the devil can tell us how big our storm is. But, God, but we can tell the devil how big our God is. Our storm is never bigger than the God who created it. Our storm is never too big for God to step in the middle of it and say, it's over, it's done, you're okay. Scholars today differ over the expression of the Lord's day. Some thinks it refers to the first day of the week. However you want to see it, when the Spirit wishes to refer to the first day of the week, He just calls it that. The expression here probably refers to the day of the Lord, a great day when God will take over and settle the accounts with this earth. When we think about that tonight, when we study the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, talks about and the day of the Lord. Do you know when the day of the Lord is? Second coming of Christ. So when you read those, those tie into the book of Revelation. It's, in, it's an instinctive age of worship. He said, I was in the Spirit. Not only was he in the Spirit, but John had his ears open. He said, I heard a great voice as a trumpet. Verse number 11. Saying... I am what? Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write it in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, and to Ephesus, and unto Sparta, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. John here in verse number 10 and verse number 11 Notice this, when he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, John didn't open his mouth, but John opened his ears and said, let me hear what God has to say. Now, when you think about that, later on in the book of Revelation, when the Lord's writing to the seven churches, what, does, what is one of the phrases that is used? He that hath a what? Ear, let him what? Hear. Great piece of advice. I learned this. As a youngin, and I'm still learning this. God gave us one mouth and two ears. That means we're supposed to listen to more than we say. Not say more than we're supposed to hear. Tonight when the Holy Spirit begins to speak, you and I must not jump and say, well, he's saying this, he's saying that, he's saying this. If I start a conversation with you and you try to end every one of my sentences, are you going to get the point that I'm trying to make? No. Tonight, you and I oftentimes can miss the will of God by putting the cart before the horse. The, the writer says, be still and know that I am God. We must be still and listen to the voice of God because it's important. Moving on, verse number 12. Verse number 10, he heard. He turned, verse number 12, the Bible says, or verse number 12, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, 
And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Verse number 10, he turned. Verse number 12, he saw. The Lord told him, whatever thou seest, I want you to write it. He gave John a vision for the things to come. I'll chase this little rabbit right here and we're going to quit right here, okay? This is a good stopping point. Twelve golden candlesticks. Go with me to verse... Cassidy, don't kill me, please. Go with me to verse number 17. The Bible says, And when I saw him, I what? Fell at his feet as dead. Notice this tonight. John turned, saw, and fell. It was instinctive worship. Tonight I get tickled, and I'm done. Tonight I get tickled at people that say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this, this, and this, and this. Really? Yeah. Okay. John, solid. John didn't ask him nothing. John fell. Moses seen a glimpse of him. And Moses came down and the people said there's something different about him by seeing just a little glimpse. I think when you and I see Christ, we're not going to ask him all of these millions of questions. But we're going to fall down at his feet and worship him for all of the good things that he does. All of our trials, all of our storms will be worth it all when we see him. I'm going to quit right there tonight. We'll pick up next week. We'll go back to verse number 13 next week. Lord willing, any questions?